Hey guys, welcome back to the studio for another episode of Guitar Fundamentals. In the last episode, we went over the concept of pivoting with arpeggios from the major scale. I've since gotten a lot of students asking me about how I practice my scales, so I thought, what better topic for the next episode could there be? Today, I'm going to teach you guys just a ton of patterns for the major scale on the guitar. We'll tackle this stuff in a super similar way to how we organize both the triads and the arpeggios. I'll first show you some one octave patterns organized by string group, and then we'll expand to two octaves before finally digging into some massive three octave shapes that can take us through the whole range of the instrument. I'll show you guys this stuff today in the key of B flat since it's kind of a common key in jazz, but make sure you practice this stuff in all 12 keys. You guys ready? Let's get started. small one octave shapes to be the most useful when it comes to improvising. These patterns offer us little slices of the scale and its modes all over the neck. Remember, improvisation doesn't consist of just playing scales up and down though, so we should really have a firm grasp of these little movements and how they connect to one another. Just like with triads and arpeggios, I find it super helpful to organize this by groups of strings. For the first group, G through E, we'll play through one octave of the major scale up and down and then move through each mode. I still think of each of these as being slices of the major though, since the way that we apply them isn't really using the mode as a key center, but rather as a chord from the major scale. Here's the first group of scale patterns. You probably noticed that I only played through one possible fingering for each shape. Now there's obviously other ways to finger these things, but we should really focus on practicing fingerings that are practical and give us access to lines or arpeggios, or both, easily. I'll take the same approach with the next three groups of scale patterns. Here, check those out. Circling back to how I don't think of these as being modes in the traditional sense, let's take a look at how this stuff can be applied over a chord change. Let's just use a 2-5-1 in this key. I can play any of these scale shapes over this movement, but I have to be careful about where I end up so that the resolution to a chord tone of B-flat makes sense. Some of these shapes will do this automatically, for example, if I start on a chord tone like this. This works really well over the whole 2-5, even though I'm only playing B-flat major and not thinking about the 2-5 at all. The reason being is that I end up on a strong note, the third, right on the downbeat. I made that happen by starting my run on the and of one so that it would line up to be rhythmically correct. However, this isn't always the case and it's not always baked into every scale. If I start on the second, for example, I don't end up on a chord tone if I play all the way to the octave. It still sounds nice because it's the ninth of the B-flat, but it's kind of ambiguous. If I stop short and land on the seventh, I do land on a chord tone, which is what I want, and that resolution sounds much stronger. Mm -hmm. 
I can then use added half steps to make chord tones land exactly where I want them to. The same thing happens if I do this descending. If I start on the second and come down, I can land on a chord tone like this. I can also use half steps here to delay the arrival of that resolution like this. So you see, once we have all these patterns strongly under our fingers, what we get is just a picture of the major scale as it exists over the entire range of the instrument. Now let's work out doing this with some bigger shapes that cover two full octaves. Now that we've got some one octave shapes under our fingers, we should expand our range into two octaves. We can still somewhat organize this by groups of strings too. Let's check out the major scale through the entire range by playing two octave shapes starting on the fifth string. Now let's do that same thing, but we'll start from the sixth string this time. Next up, we'll expand the range of these patterns one more time by doing them through three octaves and cover the entire range of the instrument. Before I show you guys these massive three octave shapes, I want to talk to you about Segovia for a second. If you're unaware, Andres Segovia, the Spanish guitarist, compiled a book of scale patterns and published it in 1953. These scale shapes consist of two and three octave patterns for major and melodic minor scales. They've been extremely influential, and the way that they're designed to take advantage of the full register of the instrument is absolutely genius. They focus more on shifting of positions and keeping the tone of different strings at the forefront rather than using like stretches and extended positions that most electric guitarists are probably used to doing. I'd highly suggest you guys go check out these scales if you've never had before. They're a fantastic piece of technical practice to add to your routine. How does this relate to what I'm about to show you? Well. These shapes, while not being a part of Segovia's patterns, we'll say for one, are highly influenced by the way in which he organized playing such expansive scale patterns on the guitar. Again, in my mind, these aren't necessarily functioning as the modes in the traditional sense, but just different chunks of the parent major scale to give me access to different parts of the harmony. Make sure that when you practice these, you finger them exactly as I do. There's gonna be some funny stuff in here that you probably aren't used to doing, but I guarantee that you're gonna get a huge technical benefit from doing these the way that I've laid out. Now, let's check out those patterns.
thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. This is obviously a ton of work to get all these shapes and patterns under your fingers, so I just need to point out here, I don't do all of this every single day. If I did, I'd never play any music at all. These are things that I try to keep on a rotation to keep myself fresh. Most of the time, I'll use the bigger scales as warm-ups and then do them extremely slowly and use the smaller ones with some half-step ideas so I can get some lines working before taking those ideas through some chord changes. Let me know down in the comments section what you guys thought of these patterns. How did you first learn your scales? I, I remember fumbling around with tons of different patterns at first before my teacher finally set me straight when I was learning to improvise. I think it's super important to organize this kind of stuff in a logical way that serves the purpose of making music and improvising instead of just practicing every single option available. Next time, I'm going to show you guys how we can use the small one octave shapes to create exercises, etudes, and lines over a standard tune so that you can practice these things in the context of an improvised solo and eventually learn to rely on your ear instead of just your fingers. Stay tuned for that one, it's really going to be great. As always, a special thanks goes out to my incredible patrons over on Patreon. This week, those folks are PH, Trent Taylor, Cedric, Damon, Josh, Paulette Christopher, David Zuckerbron, Francis Rue, and Chris Crisley. An extra special thanks goes out to Jazz Luminaire, Vibhav Bhavdi. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the studio and for helping to make these videos the best that they can be. Thanks to all of you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.